Welcome to the Why Did Joseph Smith Want to Sell the Copyright to the Book of Mormon video. And once upon a time, Lucifer said, you can buy anything in this world for money. Okay, there was a revelation given to Oliver Cowdery and Hiram Smith, the same revelation. You can find it in Doctrine and Covenants. Seek not for riches, but for wisdom. And behold, the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you, and then shall you be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. All right, D&C 46, we have another scripture. It says, For some doctrines or commandments are of men, and others are of devils. And we'll talk about that more later in the video. Okay, so Kathleen Melanakos raises an interesting question. She says, first of all, if the text of the Book of Mormon was dictated from golden plates from God, why would they ever sell the copyright? Good question. So Joseph Smith's father, Joseph Smith Sr., once boasted that after the golden plates were translated, they would be rich. That is, the Smith family would be rich. So they were looking forward looking forward to getting some money from this project. Uh, this is from the Lorenzo Saunders interview, November 12th, 1884. All right, the same interview here. It said in July of 1828, Hiram Smith, that's Joseph Smith's brother, told neighbors Orlando and Lorenzo Saunders that it was his last time to work in the fields. That is, it was Hiram Smith's last time to work in the fields since he will be taking up Mormonism and Joseph Smith will be the richest man in the country. So maybe the Smith family was looking forward to getting some money from this project. Hiram Smith said he wasn't going to work in the fields anymore and Joseph Smith will be the richest man in the country. So a little bit of background on the copyright issue. This is uh, from Rough Stone Rolling. E.B. Grandin stopped the work, stopped the work, until he could be assured of payment. He was printing the Book of Mormon. In an attempt to start the presses again, Martin Harris consented to sell part of his farm to raise some cash. Impatient with Harris's reluctance, Hiram Smith urged Joseph Smith, he urged Joseph Smith to leave him out entirely and raise the money by some other means. That is, leave Martin Harris out of it and raise the money in another way to print the Book of Mormon. And, and Hiram Smith did not like Martin Harris. So Hiram had heard that the copyright could be sold in Canada and he asked Joseph Smith to inquire of the Lord. From the excellent biography, Joseph Smith, The Making of a Prophet by Dan Vogel, in there it says, David Whitmer remembered that Hiram Smith lost patience with Martin Harris when he failed to sell part of his farm for funds to finish the printing of the Book of Mormon. So Martin Harris was a little bit slow in getting funds selling part of his farm, and that concerned Hiram Smith. All right, David Whitmer may have been correct in remembering that Hiram Smith was vexed with Brother Martin Harris. He was vexed with him and thought that they should get the money by some means outside of him and not let him have anything to do with the publication of the Book of Mormon or receiving any of the profits thereof if any profits should accrue, should occur, or should accrue. So Hiram Smith was not big on having Martin Harris finance the book, and he did not want to really share the profits of the book with Martin Harris, so he thought maybe we, we can raise the money in some other way. This is also from the same book, uh, Joseph Smith, The Making of a Prophet, and David Whitmer is pictured above here. All right, we have Martin Harris here pictured above. Joseph Smith was working on him to get him to pay for the printing of the Book of Mormon <clears throat> uh, for the first run. 
Uh, and he gave some scriptures to Martin Harris, uh, some commandments uh, in Doctrine and Covenants chapter 19. And in there it says, And again I command you that thou, Martin Harris, shalt not covet thine own property, but impart it freely to the printing of the Book of Mormon. All right, so what will happen to Martin Harris if he does not go along with the plan and put up the money for the first printing of the Book of Mormon? Well, Joseph Smith uses some fear tactics, and he tells Martin Harris in this revelation, And misery thou wilt receive if thou wilt slight these counsels. In other words, if he does not pay for the Book of Mormon to be printed, he will receive misery, yea, even destruction of thyself and property. Destruction of himself and his property. That's pretty serious. So it's better to just to go along and, and pay for the printing of the Book of Mormon. And here, of course, pictured above, we have a destroyed house or property. Okay, the revelation continues. This is DNC 19. Impart a portion of thy property, yea, even a part of thy lands, and all save, and all save the support of thy family. So, in other words, you can keep enough to support your family. All the rest you should uh, dedicate or consecrate to this project, to the printing of the Book of Mormon, and probably to the church in general. But, you know, you can keep enough to support your family. And then Joseph Smith is very direct. He says, pay the printer's debt. Release thyself from bondage. So direct revelation to Martin Harris. Pay the printer's debt. Release thyself from bondage. And here pictured above, we have the press that uh, printed the first edition of the Book of Mormon. I do believe this is the press of E.B. Grandin, now owned by the church. All right, in August 1829, Martin Harris mortgaged his farm for $3,000. It was as a security in case the Book of Mormon did not sell. So he did not give any money to E.B. Grandin yet, but basically E.B. Grandin would get the deed at least to uh, part of Martin Harris's property if they failed to pay the printer. And maybe they would be able to pay, pay for the printing through the sales of the Book of Mormon, but E.B. Grandin did not want to rely on that. And pictured above, we have a historic sign in New York about Martin Harris's farm. So about a year and a half later, on April 1st, 1831, Martin Harris was able to sell about 150 acres, uh, $20 an acre, to the longtime Palmyra resident Thomas Lakey. So selling the, those 150 acres is what eventually paid E.B. Grandin. But E.B. Grandin had to wait, you know, about a year and a half to get paid. But Martin Harris did eventually pay for it. Uh, Martin Harris was eventually repaid by the church. Uh, you can find out about this in H. Michael Marquardt's book, uh, Joseph Smith's 18 to 28 or 1828 to 1843 revelations which came out in uh, 2013 and pictured above we have martin harris's house so you can tell he was a man of means he had money and he sold quite a bit of property to help out joseph smith and the church so there are two different copyrights that we will talk about in this video one is the american copyright and one is the canadian copyright well, Joseph Smith obtained the American copyright for the Book of Mormon on June 11, 1829 in Utica, New York. And he went through the proper channels, basically, to obtain that copyright. So he, Joseph Smith did not try to sell the American copyright. He wanted to keep that in his possession and in the, in the possession of the church. So here is the verbiage for the American copyright. I'm not going to read all this. You can, go, you can read it if you want. Just pause it. Uh, the picture here is the spine of a first edition Book of Mormon. 
Uh, these are very valuable these days, and uh, there, there are some out there. And the rest of the verbiage uh, for the American copyright. And here is a picture of the actual copyright. And you can find a copy of the American copyright uh, for the Book of Mormon at the josephsmithpapers.org address on the screen. So, in September 2009, the Mormon Church found a new revelation that was given by Joseph Smith. It's new because it was newly found. Uh, when they were working on the Joseph Smith Papers project, they found it. The revelation is about selling the Canadian copyright of the Book of Mormon. You can read about this in the Desert News. Okay, so the Canadian copyright revelation was part of the newly found Book of Commandments and Revelations, otherwise known as the BCR, which was found in the First Presidency's archive when the archive was cataloged. And it was part of the Joseph Smith Papers Project, as I mentioned earlier. The BCR is also known as Revelation Book Number 1. I don't know why the church calls it that, but they call it Revelation Book Number 1. Most of the revelations in the BCR made it into the Book of Commandments published by the church in 1833. So first we have the Book of Commandments and Revelations. Uh, those, or that's also called the Revelation Book 1. Those made it into the Book of Commandments, <clears throat> most of them. And then the Book of Commandments became the Doctrine and Covenants of the church. Uh, however, the Canadian copyright revelation was left out of the Book of Commandments and was never published until 2009. So for some reason, Joseph Smith and others did not want to publish the Canadian copyright revelation, and it was left out of the scriptures, the Book of Commandments of the church. And the apostle Joseph Fielding Smith also admits that not all the revelations given to Joseph Smith, the prophet or the seer, were placed in the Doctrine and Covenants in his day, or the Book of Commandments. Some were not put in there. Some of them were for the church and not for the world. Okay, so this new revelation and the complete BCR slash Revelation Book Number 1 can also be found in a book or volume entitled Revelations and Translations, Manuscript Revelations Books Volume 1, published by the Joseph Smith Papers Project, and you have to commend the church for doing this project. The Canadian copyright revelation can be found online at the josephsmithpapers.org website. Uh, we are going to go through most of it in this video, though. All right, we talked about this a little bit already, uh, but at the time of this revelation, Canadian copyright revelation, the Book of Mormon was at the printer's office, and that's why I went over all that stuff with Martin Harris. The Canadian copyright revelation was received in January, February, or March of 1830. Uh, the exact date is not known. The beginning of the revelation or commandment starts out like this. It says, a revelation given to Oliver, that's Oliver Cowdery, uh, Hiram, which is Hiram Page, Josiah, which is Josiah Stowell, and Joseph Knight, who is Joseph Knight Sr. Uh, the revelation was given at Manchester, Ontario County, New York. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the four men who the revelation was given to. Uh, Oliver Cowdery was the first baptized Latter-day Saint. He was one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon Golden Plates. He was one of the first Latter-day Saint apostles, and he was a Book of Mormon scribe for Joseph Smith. Uh, in his youth, Cowdery hunted for buried treasure using a divining rod, and we'll talk about that a little more later. Hiram Page was one of the eight witnesses to the Book of Mormon golden plates. In August of 1830, Page was using a seer stone to receive revelations for the Mormon church, and Joseph Smith got after him for that and said that he, Joseph Smith was the only one that could use a seer stone. In 1825, Josiah Stoll hired Joseph Smith to help him find a Spanish gold or silver mine in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, Joseph used his seer stone in a hat to try to find the mine, but they could not find it. So you'll notice that several of these men who the revelation was given to uh, were Joseph Smith's treasure-seeking or treasure-digging buddies. And Joseph Knight Sr. provided significant material support, that is money, to Joseph Smith's translation and publication of the Book of Mormon. In November 1826, Joseph worked for Knight, and there are reports that he directed further treasure digging excavations on Knight's property in New York. So another uh, treasure digging buddy, Joseph Knight Sr. Okay, the revelation continues. It says, I, God, have covenanted with my servant Joseph Smith that earth nor hell combined against him shall not take the blessing out of his hands, out of his hands, which I have prepared for him. So there is a blessing that hell or earth cannot take away from Joseph Smith. If he walketh uprightly before me, neither the spiritual nor the temporal. So there's the idea here that there's going to be a temporal blessing. Okay, it continues. Blessing and behold, I, God, also covenanted with those who have assisted Joseph Smith in my work. Those that are helping Joseph Smith also have, also have a covenant from God. That I will do unto them even the same because they have done that which is pleasing in my sight. So that even the same uh, blessings that Joseph Smith will get, which are temporal and spiritual blessings. So uh, uh, spiritual blessings, but also monetary or money blessings. Because they have done that which is pleasing in my sight, yea, even all, save Martin Harris. So they've all done good works, except for Martin Harris, because he was slow in in getting the money to help pay for the publishing of the Book of Mormon. And here we, we have a, uh, kind of a grisly picture of Martin Harris. Okay, wherefore be diligent in securing the copyright of my servant. And the servant is Joseph Smith. Be diligent in securing the copyright unto him whom he willeth, according as I, God, shall command him, that the faithful and the righteous may retain the temporal blessings as well as the spiritual. So again, the idea of temporal blessings, money or monetary uh, blessings, uh, which would not only go to Joseph Smith, but also the people that were helping him uh, go up to Canada and secure the copyright. And here we have some old money. I believe it's from the 1830s, 25 shillings, which says five on it. I'm not sure if that's five dollars. Or what? But it's 25 shillings of uh, Canadian Toronto money, pr probably from the 1830s. And also that my work be not destroyed by the workers of iniquity to their own destruction and damnation when they are fully ripe. So maybe that is involving people that were going to copy the Book of Mormon and sell it uh, in Canada with no copyright. Okay, and then he specifies in more detail who is to go on the trip. He says, Now behold, I say unto you that I, God, have covenanted, and it pleaseth me that Oliver Cowdery, Joseph Knight, Hiram Page, and Josiah Stowell shall do my work in this thing, yea, even securing the copyright. And he misspells uh, three of the people's names here, but we know who they are. And they shall do it, with an eye single to my glory. Wherefore, I say unto you that ye shall go to Kingston, and that is in Ontario, Canada, seeking me continually. And if ye do this, ye shall have my spirit to go with you, and ye shall have an addition of all things which is expedient in me. Ye shall have an addition, <coughs> an addition of all things. That's temporal blessings. So here we see where they started out in Manchester, New York. They went across the lake, Lake Ontario, because it was frozen over, so they didn't have to go all the way around. And you can see Kingston is just on the other side of the lake. I grant unto my servant Joseph Smith a privilege that he may sell a copyright through you, speaking after the manner of men, 
for the four provinces. And now at this time in 1830, there was only four provinces. That was Ontario, which is the place they were going, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Uh, now there's quite a few more than that. Uh, anyway, uh, if the people harden not their hearts against the enticings of my spirit and my word. So they may sell a copyright through you, the four guys that were going uh, to Kingston, if the people harden not their hearts. Behold, my way is before you. That's God's way. And the means I will prepare. So God says he is going to pre prepare a way, the means God will prepare so that they can accomplish their mission. And the blessing I hold in mine own hand, which is temporal and spiritual. And if ye are faithful, I will pour out upon you even as much as ye are able to bear. And thus it shall be. So God in the Revelation is telling the four men, I will pour out upon you even as much as ye are able to bear. A lot of temporal blessings, maybe even gold, silver, cash, and money. And this is what he is promising to his treasure-seeking buddies. So maybe they thought this was going to be a pretty good deal. They were going to be able to sell uh, the copyright for a considerable sum of money. Uh, or maybe uh, there's, there's some people that have insinuated that maybe they went on this trip for a different uh, mission. Uh, maybe something to do with counterfeiting, but uh, that's conjecture. So God said that he would prepare a way, the means he would prepare, but that's really not what happened. So this is a letter from Mr. Trauber in 1881. Let's read this, the little part of it. The revelation promised them success and all that sort of stuff. Well, the boys went over on the ice, the frozen lake, and as they had not money enough to bear their expenses, came back nearly starved, completely wearied, and no money nor copyright sold either. So really the, the means and the ways of preparing the way before them by God really didn't happen. And not only did they get no money, but they didn't, didn't even have enough money to bear their expenses. They nearly starved, came back really wearied. It was very cold. I'm sure everything's frozen over. It's Canada. It's very cold. Uh, and they, had, they got no money and w was not able to sell the copyright. Uh, this letter can be found in Wilhelm Ritter von Weimettel's book, Mormon Portraits, 1886. And another account by Traubert, it says that David Whitmer also stated uh, that Cowdery and Page had little or no money with them. So it's the idea of going without uh, purse or script, I guess. They had little or no money with them and came back to New York almost starved. So is that really preparing the way for them? I don't think so. All right, we're now going to go through the account by Hiram Page. He's one of the guys that went on the trip. Uh, this account is a letter between Hiram Page and William E. McClellan on February 2nd, 1848, so about 18 years after the revelation and trip was given. Uh, you can find these accounts in Dan Vogel's works, uh, Early Mormon Documents. So uh, this is what Hiram Page said. Uh, Joseph Smith heard that there was a chance to sell a copyright in Canada for any useful book that was used in the States. All right. So in the same account here, Hiram Page, remember he's one of the eight witnesses of the Book of Mormon. He says, Joseph Smith thought this would be a good opportunity to get a handsome sum of money which was to be after the expenses were taken out, which was to be for the exclusive benefit of the Smith family and was to be at the disposal of, of Joseph. So maybe he never intended to give any of the money to the four brethren who went on the trip uh, because Hiram Page said that they were trying to get a handsome sum of money for the exclusive benefit of the Smith family who was broke at the time. And Page continues, he says, The necessary preparation was made by them in a sly manner. 
The necessary preparation was made in a sly manner so as to keep Martin Harris from drawing a share of the money. So again, it's the idea that they were trying to keep Martin Harris out of this and come up with another way to fund the Book of Mormon so they wouldn't have to uh, rely on Martin Harris. We were all anxious to get a revelation to go, and when it came, we were to go to Kingston, that's in Ontario, Canada, where we were to sell the copyright if they would not harden their hearts. So that is a condition. Uh, where we were to sell, and he's talking about the copyright. And Page continues in the same account, but when we got there, that's in Kingston, Canada, there was no purchaser, neither were they authorized at Kingston to buy the rights for the province. So they got there, there was nobody to buy the copyright, and he says there was nobody authorized at Kingston to buy the copyright. And Hiram Page said that Little York was the place where such business had to be done. So I guess the people in Kingston told him that they should go to Little York, which is now Toronto, Canada. And that was the place where such business as copyright had to be done. And then Page says something very interesting. He says, we were to get $8,000. And that's a lot of money back in 1830. Remember that the printing of the Book of Mormon was only $3,000 for that first run. Uh, they were trying to get $8,000, $5,000 more than that. And Page said that was to go to the Smith family and to Joseph Smith. Um, by way of comparison, $8,000 in 1830 is equivalent in purchasing power to $218,000 today in 2019. It's a lot of money. You can buy a house with that money. And he, sa he says, we were treated with the best of respects by all that we met with, by all that we met with in Kingston. And then Page says, by the above, we may learn how a revelation may be received and the person receiving it not be benefited. He's probably talking about himself and the other three guys that went on the trip. Uh, Hiram Page went on the trip, uh, this is about 18 years later he's saying this, but he was not benefited. He got no money, and in fact, they ran out of money and nearly starved. So Hiram Page may have considered this revelation to be a false prophecy uh, by Joseph Smith. I'm going to go through a few uh, passages here in an MA thesis on Hiram Page. Uh, this was done at BYU in 1987 by Bruce G. Stewart, his master's thesis. It says, from the beginning of Mormonism's formal organization, Hiram Page felt that there was a digression in Joseph Smith's prophetic ability. So as it went along, Hiram Page thought that there was a digression in Joseph Smith's prophetic ability, and the Canadian copyright, copyright revelation may be one reason for that. Okay, so in the same thesis... He says, in Hiram Page's mind, evidence of Joseph Smith's loss of power after giving up his stone was demonstrated in what he called the case of the Canada Affair. Basically, this trip that Hiram Page went on to sell the Canadian copyright. So he maybe interpreted that as a loss in Joseph Smith's prophetic abilities. Up above here, we have a statement by Richard Bushman. That, said, that talks about Joseph Smith writing scripture in other people's name. Other people's names. It's called Pseudepigrapha. Uh, the books of Moses and of Abraham and the writings of Enoch and the book of Moses. All those uh, Joseph Smith is writing in another person's name. But he's really the one writing it. Pseudepigrapha are falsely attributed works and texts whose claimed author is not the true author. So kind of a loss of prophetic power there. All right, so in the same thesis, and remember this whole thesis is about Hiram Page, so he's, he's done some good work here. It says, in later years, Hiram Page and the others dated the beginning of Joseph's fall with these events. And he's talking about the Canadian Revelation. The beginning of Joseph Smith's fall, or his apostasy as a prophet, started with this Canadian revelation. 
All right, we're now going to go through some accounts by William E. McClellan. This one is to John L. Trauber, 1877. Joseph Smith's revelation for Oliver Cowdery to go to Canada was never printed. And he means never printed in the scriptures. It never made it into the Book of Commandments. That is true. Martin Harris had the copy that I read in manuscript. So McClellan was able to read a copy of the Revelation because Martin Harris had a copy of it. Uh, but it was never published, basically, is what he's saying. So William E. McClellan was actually one of the original members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And he left the church in 1838, so about eight years after the Revelation was given. Okay, so another account here from William E. McClellan to Trowbear. This one is in February 19, 1877. He says, Joseph Smith delivered a long revelation to go to Kingston in Canada and get a copyright in order to sell it and to make money out of its sale. Yes, about $8,000 is what they wanted. They went, <coughs> they went, but did not succeed, and the revelation proved so false that Joseph never would have it printed or put with his other revelations. So it was McClellan's opinion that since it was a false revelation, that's why Joseph Smith did not want it printed in the standard works of the church or put with his other revelations, kind of wanted to hide it. Okay, another account. Uh, this can be found in the William E. McClellan papers, a nice collection that came out in uh, 2007. He says, Joseph, Joseph Smith wanted to sell the Book of Mormon in the Canadian Dominion in order to raise money. Sell the book in the Canadian Dominion. Uh, when Joseph Smith first saw the plates, the thoughts of riches sprang into his heart. He imagined that the sale of his book in Canada would bring him in funds, but in this he was failed. All right, so here William E. McClellan says uh, that he thought the revelation was a false revelation, uh, the Canadian copyright revelation. He says, uh, now if he, Joseph Smith, as revelator, delivered a false revelation so near his beginning out of his own heart or from Satan, so maybe the revelation came out of his own head or maybe it came from Satan, what confidence can any intelligent man have in his after production? So any of his revelations or scriptures that came after this. So he's saying, anyway, since it is a false revelation, we really, really can't have confidence in Joseph Smith. So then McClellan gives his opinion uh, that Joseph Smith basically wanted to hide this revelation. He says, they are bound as I am to receive them, that's Joseph Smith's revelations, with many doubts. He's saying he, he received Joseph's revelations with many doubts. Joseph wanted this revealment of his to die and never be remembered by any mortal man. This, this copyright revelation regarding Canada, he wanted it to die and never be remembered. That's McClellan's opinion. Okay, from the same collection of uh, McClellan's papers, he says this revealment, the copyright revelation regarding Canada, was a miserable piece of wickedness. The copyright revelation about Canada was a miserable piece of wickedness. So really letting his opinion be known here. It was trying to seek riches out of sacred things. He's saying Joseph Smith was trying to seek riches out of sacred things. Now, why would you want to sell the, the, the rights, the ownership to the sacred word of God? You, it seems like you'd want to keep that within the church, within your own power, instead of trying to sell sacred things. Uh, hence, it, to a great measure, for good, destroyed Joseph Smith's usefulness for spirituality. So that's uh, McClellan's opinion. Here we have a great treasure that's called the Ark of the Covenant pictured above here. You know, I, you really doubt that the uh, Jewish people would ever sell this, this, this valuable piece of treasure. The Ark of the Covenant where the uh, ten 
commandments are supposed to be deposited. Okay, so here is an account by J.L. Traubear, and it's called False Prophecies, the Traubear Collection. Uh, it's basically just going over material that we've already gone over, so you can read this if you want. So we will now go over an account by David Whitmer. This was an interview with the Omaha, Nebraska Herald, October 10th, 1886. So what is that, like 56 years later, quite a, quite a long time later. That's why uh, Hiram Page's account is probably more accurate. But it's interesting to see what uh, David Whitmer said. He said, Hiram Smith, the patriarch, which was a very high position in the church at that time. I, I think it was right below the uh, position of Joseph Smith as prophet. Uh, Hiram Smith, the patriarch, proposed that some of them take the manuscript of the Book of Mormon to Canada and there sell the copyright for sufficient money to enable them to get out the publication of the Book of Mormon. All right, so David Whitmer was one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon's golden plates and was one of the six original members of the church. Uh, the other two witnesses of the plates were Oliver Cowdery and Martin Harris. Oliver Cowdery went on the trip. David Whitmer heard about this trip afterwards. And then David Whitmer says in the same interview, uh, a revelation was procured to order and warranted to fit a thing which occurred with remarkable frequency afterwards. So a revelation that kind of fit the circumstances, which was fairly, a com fairly common for Joseph Smith. A lot of the Doctrine and Covenants is like that. You know, there's a certain circumstance going on. Joseph Smith inquires of the Lord to find out what to do in that circumstance. And he says they went, that is, to Kingston, Canada. They also returned, but they brought no money with them and no promise of any. So they weren't able to sell the copyright. They brought no money back with them. Uh, you know, nearly starved and destitute. And no promise that they could sell the copyright later on. Okay, so another interesting account by David Whitmer. This is in uh, a letter from Mr. Traubear. It's in Y Metal's book, again, Mormon Portraits. Letter was sometime around 1881. He says, David Whitmer said that Brother Joseph Smith, are you going to publish all of those revelations? And Joseph Smith replied, yes, all in the order of their dates. Then David Whitmer asked, are you going to publish, are you going to publish that revelation for Oliver and Hiram to go to Kingston and get out a copyright for the Book of Mormon? Are you going to publish that revelation that was given? And Joe hung his head. Joseph Smith hung his head a while, and then he answered, no. Why not, Brother Joseph, asked the honest David Whitmer. Because, replied Joseph Smith, it was not true. The revelation was not true, according to uh, Joseph Smith, being uh, relayed uh, through David Whitmer uh, in a letter uh, from Mr. Traubear. All right, so we're now going to go through the lengthy account uh, by David Whitmer in his book slash pamphlet, An Address to All Believers in Christ. Came out in 1887, so it is that maybe 57 years after the event. Maybe his memory is not perfect. However, it's still interesting to see what David Whitmer says about the event. He said, Brother Hiram Smith said that it had been suggested to him that some of the brethren might go to Toronto, Canada. So he says Toronto instead of Kingston. He's wrong about that. Uh, and sell the copyright of the Book of Mormon for considerable money. There is, there's the word considerable money, $8,000. And he persuaded Joseph Smith to inquire of the Lord about it. So this was Hiram Smith's idea. And then David Whitmer talks about how Joseph Smith received the revelation. He received it through his seer stone. This revelation about Canada. So he says, Joseph Smith concluded to do so. He had not yet given up the seer stone or the peep stone. 
Uh, Whitmer just calls it the stone. Uh, Joseph looked into his hat in which he placed the stone, the same way that he supposedly translated the Book of Mormon, and he received a revelation that some of the brethren should go to Toronto, Canada. He got the revelation through the seer stone in his hat and that they would sell the copyright of the Book of Mormon. Okay, so he continues and he says, Hiram Page and Oliver Cowdery went to Toronto on this mission. So he forgets about uh, Josiah Stowell and uh, Joseph Knight Sr. But he does remember Hiram Page and Oliver Cowdery. So they went to Toronto, but they failed entirely to sell the copyright. They failed, returning without any money. All right, so Whitmer continues again. This is, this is all from the address to all believers in Christ. He says... Joseph Smith was at my father's house when they returned. So this is how David Whitmer heard about it. Joseph Smith was over at his father's house, David Whitmer's father, and Hiram Page and Oliver Cowdery had come back, and they were there also at Whitmer's father's house. So he, this is where he heard the story. He didn't go with them, but he was there when they got back. Uh, I was there also and am a witness or an eyewitness to these facts. Jacob Whitmer and John Whitmer were also present when Hiram Page and Oliver Cowdery returned from Canada. Okay, so David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, and Hiram Page are all there with the prophet Joseph Smith at Whitmer's father's house. And they asked Joseph Smith about the revelation. Uh, so Whitmer, Whitmer says, well, we were all in great trouble and we asked Joseph Smith how it was that he had received a revelation from the Lord for some brethren to go to Toronto and sell the copyright. How is it that you received this revelation, Joseph? They're asking him. And the brethren had utterly failed in their undertaking. And here is the account of what Joseph Smith did and what he said. Uh, he got another revelation. So Whitmer uh, says, uh, Joseph Smith did not know how that it was, how, th how it was that they failed. So he inquired of the Lord about it. And behold, the following revelation came through the seer stone or the peep stone. So Joseph Smith didn't know how this happened. Now, he didn't know how it failed, so he's getting another revelation through the seer stone, and this is what came through the stone uh, to Joseph Smith as a new revelation. It says, Some revelations are of God, some revelations are of man, and some revelations are of the devil. And then David Whitmer had the following to say. Remember, he's one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon Golden Plates. He's a pretty important person in uh, Mormon history. He says, So we see that the revelation to go to Toronto and sell the copyright was not of God. If it was of God, they would have been successful and they wouldn't have failed, right? This is David Whitmer's opinion. Based on what he said Joseph Smith told him, what Joseph Smith told David Whitmer through a revelation through the seer stone. So Joseph Smith is basically admitting it was not of God, but it was of the devil or of the heart of man. So how is it that Joseph Smith gets a, re a revelation from the devil or he gets a revelation from his own heart? The philosophies of men, as Mormons like to say. That's kind of scary. H how do you know when Joseph Smith is getting a correct revelation? How do you know if it's really from God? If sometimes Joseph Smith gets a revelation from the devil or from the heart of man, the philosophies of men, and this is Socrates, <coughs> Socrates pictured above, the philosophies of men, which sometimes I actually prefer to scripture. Most, most of the time, I would say uh, philosophy and literature much better than scripture. And Whitmer continues in another passage. He says, I will say it here that I could tell you other false revelations that came through Brother Joseph Smith as mouthpiece. I can tell you other false revelations that Joseph Smith talked about or gave. 
not through the stone. So he got some other revelations in a different way, not through the stone, but this will suffice. So he just goes into the Canadian copyright revelation as one of the prime examples of false revelation. He could tell you other ones, but this will suffice. And then Whitmer says, many of Brother Joseph Smith's revelations were never printed, many of them. The revelation to go to Canada was written down on paper, but it was never printed. Why was it never put into the scriptures? It should have made it into the Book of Commandments and then into the Doctrine and Covenants. Were they trying to hide it? And Whitmer gives another opinion. He says, when Brother Joseph Smith was humble... He had the Spirit of God with him, but when he was not humble, he did not have the Spirit. All right, so from the same account here, uh, Whitmer says, In the spring of 1830, Joseph gave the seer stone to Oliver Cowdery, a.k.a. peep stone or seer stone. He gave it to Oliver Cowdery and told me, as well as the rest, that he was through with it, he was done with the seer stone. And Whitmer says he did not use the stone anymore after this time. So he got his revelations in other ways. Uh, basically just uh, through prayer from God speaking to him in his own mind, I guess. And, of course, he translated Egyptian papyri as well without the stone. Uh, the, the church has admitted that Joseph Smith used seer stones, these magic kind of uh, implements, these peep stones. And they even put out a book, and here are some pictures of one of the stones that Joseph Smith had in this book. So Whitmer continues to talk about Revelation. He says, the revelations after this came through Joseph Smith as mouthpiece, that is, he would inquire of the Lord, pray and ask concerning a matter, and speak out the revelation, which he thought to be a revelation from the Lord. But sometimes he was mistaken about it being the word of the Lord. So David Whitmer, one of the three witnesses, says, sometimes Joseph Smith was mistaken about his revelations being the word of the Lord, a.k.a. they came from his own uh, mind or heart or from the devil. So I will go through some passages now from the book Quest for Refuge. This is a book uh, by Marvin S. Hill, 1989. He says, Joseph Capron wrote that Joseph Smith hoped that his volume, the Book of Mormon, would relieve the family from all pecuniary embarrassment would relieve the family from monetary embarrassment, basically. So was the Book of Mormon project just another way to make money for the Smith family? Hard to prove. We, we know about Joseph Smith's treasure digging days where he and his father tried to make money for the family. Maybe they thought they could make money by uh, putting out this uh, book from the Golden Plates maybe make money selling it. And then they really found the way to make money later on, and that was to establish a church and collect money from its members. So another passage from this book, it says, Joseph Smith himself admitted in his unpublished history that he sought the plates in order to obtain riches. And Hiram Smith also wrote to his grandfather, Asael, that he believed that service to the Lord would bring the family their long-awaited prosperity. And then Marvin S. Hill just makes a direct statement. He says, while translating the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith and his new wife, Emma, were, were completely destitute. While they were translating the Book of Mormon, they were completely destitute. Pretty much the whole family was. Uh, his parents, uh, Hiram, they were all broke. They were living on handouts from sympathetic neighbors like Joseph Knight and Martin Harris and others who, who had money. Joseph the prophet hoped 
that the publication of the Book of Mormon would provide the income his family so desperately needed. Joseph Smith hoped that the publication of the Book of Mormon would provide the income his family so desperately needed. And so maybe selling the Canadian copyright was part of that. So Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy Mack Smith, said that when the Book of Mormon was finally published in March 1830, the family had to sell copies. The family had to sell copies of the book in order to buy food. So that's how destitute they were. And Grant Palmer, in his book, The Insider's View of Mormon Origins, mentions that economically the family, that's the Smith family, was in dire straits. Uh, Lucy Mack Smith said that when Joseph Smith brought the plates home in September of 1827, there was not a shilling in the house. So at the time he brought home the plates, there was not a shilling in the house. <clears throat> so was this project done in order, to, in order to make money? Okay, the church historian and general authority B.H. Roberts, he's a member of the 70, in his impressive work, The Comprehensive History of the Church, Volume 1, he says the revelation respecting the Toronto journey was not of God. The revelation respecting the Toronto journey, and uh, it should say Kingston, he says that revelation was not of God. Pretty direct statement for a general authority to make. Joseph Smith got a revelation that was not of God. Well, was it of the devil? Was it of his own mind? Surely, else it would not have failed. If it was of God, the revelation would not have failed. Okay, so B.H. Roberts continues, and he talks about what he thinks happened with this revelation, this strange revelation for the Canadian copyright. He says, The prophet Joseph Smith, overwrought in his deep anxiety for the progress of the work or of the church, not sure how B.H. Roberts knows that he was in deep anxiety and was overwrought, uh, that's getting into the psychology of Joseph Smith's mind. But anyway, he was overwrought in his deep anxiety, and so he, he <clears throat> Joseph Smith saw reflected in the seer stone his own thought. So he got the revelation from his own thought reflected in the seer stone, or that which was suggested to him by his brother Hiram. That's how he got the revelation the thoughts of Hiram Smith or from his own thought rather than the thought of God. Now, you'll notice he doesn't bring up the option that Joseph Smith may have gotten it, gotten it from the devil, which even Joseph Smith mentioned when David Whitmer talked to him about it. And there's a passage in the DNC that talks about getting revelations from the devil, uh, which I gave at the beginning of this video. Roberts does not want to mention that. That's too controversial, even for him, even though he is, for a, for a Mormon historian, he's fairly honest. He wants you to think, well, it was his own thought reflected in the seer stone or the thought of his brother Hiram, but it was not the thought of God, but he does not mention that, oh yeah, by the way, Joseph Smith received a revelation from the devil. So Roberts wants to defend the church here doing a little bit of apologetics he says how important for the prophet's disciples members of the church to know that not every voice heard by the spirit of man is the voice of god not every voice is from god not every impression made upon the mind of joseph smith is an impression from a divine source even if you're a prophet Sometimes you get it from a source that is not divine. Sometimes you may get it from the devil. And that's scary because whenever you look at the teachings and sayings of the Mormon prophets, 
How do you know if it's not from his own mind or from the devil? Well, then you're supposed to pray about it yourself. And then you get revelation into your own mind. But you're also supposed to obey and believe what the Mormon leaders tell you. So <laughs> it's a catch-22. All right, so that reminds me of a talk that was given by Ezra Taft Benson. He's the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, 1980 at BYU, a few years before he became prophet. The talk is called 14 Fundamentals in Following the Prophet. It's an interesting talk that I recommend reading. He, he even says that following the current prophet is more important than following the scriptures, which disagrees with other general authorities like Bruce R. McConkie and several others. But anyway, in that talk, it says, My boy, you always keep your eye on the president of the church. Keep your eye on the prophet. And if he ever tells you to do anything and it is wrong... And you do it, the prophet tells you to do something, and it is wrong, but you do it anyway, the Lord will still bless you for it, even for doing something wrong, even for doing something that is a sin. So if you have a, the prophet of the church that gets a revelation from the devil, and God forbid tells you to do something horrible, because of course if it's a revelation from the devil, it's wrong, and you do it, the Lord will still bless you for it, for doing something horrible, for committing sin. That's why it takes religion to get a good man or woman to do something evil. It takes religion for that. Otherwise, you leave a good man or woman to themselves. They make good choices most of the time. But the Bible is full of this kind of stuff. Getting a revelation from God to do something wrong, but they do it anyway because they think it's from God. Like sacrificing your own son, like slavery, like wiping out the Amalekites, like taking people's land. And on that note, we are going to conclude this video. And I thank you for watching the Why Did Joseph Smith Want to Sell the Copyright to the Book of Mormon? video.